well, I think that uh, the biggest challenge of Bitcoin is that the industry refers to it as a cryptocurrency, and oftentimes people refer to it as a digital currency, and there's a very vocal, uh, a vocal contingent that wants it to be a currency. And, um, and the rest of the world doesn't really understand money, so everybody looks at Bitcoin and they think, well, how do I create the next Cash App, or the next mobile app, or the next Fidelity, or the next Coinbase, or the next whatever? And they, they think really hard about that, or, or how, do I, how do I topple JP Morgan? It's like, that's a very difficult thing to do. I'll give you a very simple idea. Recently, the world of cryptocurrency witnessed a significant event as Bitcoin, the flagship digital currency, experienced a notable drop in value. Last Sunday, the value of Bitcoin fell from about $67,000 to below $63,000 in a matter of hours. This steep drop translated into a 3.7% reduction in less than a day, which sent shockwaves across the market, even if it managed a small recovery to $64,000. This decline in the value of Bitcoin set off a wide wider market sell-off, as seen by the 4.4% decline in the Coindesk 20 index. During this turbulence, Santa's token saw a notable fall of more than 10%. The dramatic change came after a brief spike that indicated the unpredictable behavior of cryptocurrency markets and was partly driven by upbeat Federal Reserve policy. Nevertheless, there were challenges to the following market rebound, with ongoing sell-offs noted, especially in spot Bitcoin ETFs traded in the US, due mostly to significant withdrawals from the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, these ETFs saw net negative flows for four days in a row, indicating a gloomy attitude among investors. In a recent interview, well-known cryptocurrency expert Michael Saylor offered his observations amid these market swings. Saylor is convinced that the price correction that Bitcoin has seen recently and its natural volatility are only a part of the cryptocurrency's evolutionary path towards universal adoption and stability. He emphasizes the longer trend of Bitcoin's acceptance and resiliency, viewing such such brief market swings as expected fluctuations. Saylor offered a balanced viewpoint in response to common complaints about Bitcoin, including its energy usage and price volatility. He emphasized the mining industry's continuous developments in renewable energy sources, implying that concerns over Bitcoin's environmental effect may eventually fade as sustainability advances. Saylor also emphasized the maturing Bitcoin market, pointing out that higher liquidity and institutional involvement will probably eventually lead to more price stability. Let's hear what he has to say you know I, I think 2020 to 2024 was you know the it was the uh, I don't know high volatility high uncertainty it's like that early stage of institutional adoption but really we start mainstream institutional adoption I would date it to January 2024 with the approval of the ETFs the spot ETFs and I think it runs, we have about a 10 year gold rush. It runs to 2034 November. Between 2024 and 2034, we will uh, have mined 99% of all the Bitcoin. So, so Bitcoin becomes for all practical purposes fixed by November of 2024. The last 1% comes out over a hundred years. Okay, so we, we, uh, we have this 42 quarter period where at the beginning of the period... What percentage are we at now? Right now we're like uh, 94%. Wow. So it, you got, you, you've got, you, you think it's not much, but I mean 5% is a lot <laughs> over nice 10 thing. years compared to 1% over 100 years. So there's actually still Bitcoin available for sale right now. The miners have to sell it. So at the beginning of this period in Q1, we're in Q1 now, if you go to January 1st, no institution could buy it, even if they wanted to. It just wasn't on their radar. So you really have 42 quarters of people learning what it is, studying it. It takes 10 hours to scratch the surface, and it takes 100 hours before you get a degree of comfort. Most people, you know, once they get past the age of 40, they don't want to spend 100 hours learning a new thing. It's, it's very rare. So. You've got Wall Street firms spinning up massive education apparatus. You've, you've got a whole set of stages of adoption. First, can I buy it? Then is it on the, the approved list for solicited sale? Then is it on the approved list for unsolicited sale? Is it marginable? Can I borrow against it? Is it optionable? Can I hedge it? 
is it recommended, is it structural, is it built into a fund? That's like seven layers of adoption. People take a year to think about each of those layers. There's a, a hundred powerful entities that control huge amounts of money that will go through that in the Western world. So I think we're in this, this institutional education stage. And um, in 2034, it'll simply be the new thing. Right now, it's like, it's like the scary, exotic, thing for most people. Well, I think that uh, the biggest challenge of Bitcoin is that the industry refers to it as a cryptocurrency, and oftentimes people refer to it as a digital currency, and there's a very vocal, uh, a vocal contingent that wants it to be a currency. And, um, and the rest of the world doesn't really understand money, so if you say to someone, what do you think about Bitcoin as digital currency? They say, well, I think it threatens the dollar. I hate it. If you said, what do you think about Bitcoin as digital property? You know, I'm going to buy it instead of buying a building in Des Moines. They're like, oh, have at it. If you, if you simply conceptualize it as property, or, which is store of value, all of the objections, all of the straw man objections, like it's used but for money laundering, it's, it's, not, it's not legal tender, I can't buy coffee with it, it's not fast enough, it's not private. All of these things disappear because it's about as stupid as saying to Bob Kraft, you can't buy a cup of coffee with the New England Patriots by breaking off some, you know, one of your tight ends. And you can't buy a cup of coffee with your building in Boston. You know, so of course I can't. You can't buy a cup of coffee with part of a Picasso in the lower left corner, right? But, but, you know, wealthy people have been using them as a store of value and as money for 500 years. The usage of Bitcoin has rapidly increased in Argentina, as evidenced by the fact that in March, during a single week, the most purchases made in over two years occurred. The country is now experiencing an extraordinarily high rate of 276% inflation, which is severely undermining the value of the peso, the country's currency. This corresponds with a boom in Bitcoin activity. Due to these economic difficulties, more and more Argentinians are looking for safe options to protect their money. Although the US dollar has historically been a preferred option, recent events such as the relative strength of the peso and governmental initiatives have diminished its appeal. Although the president's long-term goal is to increase Argentina's economic integration with the U.S. currency, the immediate priority is keeping the value of the peso stable. Because of the current state of the economy, more Argentinians are turning to Bitcoin because they believe it to be a safer way to protect their funds from the uncertainties affecting the national economy. Let's go back to the interview where Michael Saylor provides more knowledgeable analysis. Everybody looks at Bitcoin and they think, well, how do I create the next Cash App or the next mobile app or the next Fidelity or the next Coinbase or the next whatever? And they, they think really hard about that or, or how, do I, how do I topple JP Morgan? It's like, that's a very difficult thing to do. I'll give you a very simple idea. You have a treasury in your company. Uh, if you put your treasury into sovereign debt, you're going to yield 5% pre-tax, 3% after tax and you're not going to beat the cost of capital. The cost of capital right now is 8 to 10% in the U.S. Easy. So if that's the case, your treasury is a liability, which means that any rational person would look at you and say you should decapitalize, you should, give all, you should run on the minimum working capital or negative working capital, and you should run on debt. But I'll give you another idea. If you actually are investing in something you expect to go up 20 to 40% a year for the next decade, you're beating the cost of capital by a factor of two. That means the right thing to do is go back to your venture capitalist or your bank and just raise $100 million that you don't need and buy Bitcoin with it. Because if, if the business you're running doesn't work, you will have a business that's growing 20 to 30% a year scalably for the next 30 years, that will work, right? You'll double the 100 million two times in the next six years, so it'll be 200, 400 million. In six years, when the thing that you're doing right now doesn't work, you're gonna have a business that's growing 20% a year off a $400 million base, which is a monopoly. So most, I think, the number one, I mean, this is a simple hack, but Every venture capitalist in the world is getting two and 20. They're getting a 2% management fee and a 20% participation. And 
their mandate is they have to invest in operating businesses that are private. And if they were to go and buy a billion dollars of Bitcoin with limited partner capital, their limited partners would say, are you crazy? I could have bought Bitcoin. So the VC can't buy Bitcoin, which is the risk-free return of 20, 30% a year. The VC can give you the $100 million, you can buy the Bitcoin. They end up with debt in a private company. You end up with uh, 100, 200, 500 million dollar business growing 20, 30% a year that's scalable that you run with yourself and your CFO. It's good for them. They're gonna make a fortune. They, they want to invest the money. The real problem in the world, and, and by the way, this is back to the Dow of Steve. In the Dow of Steve, there's a guy sitting on the bed and he's smoking marijuana and, and someone's saying, well, you know, like, why aren't you out there doing something? He says, doing stuff is highly overrated. <laughs> okay? So here's the big idea, which is, there's a couple hundred trillion dollars of capital in the world that's debasing at 10% a year right now. And the big idea is just stop investing in toxic money, right? Michael Saylor provides a fresh viewpoint in his comments on how companies should divide up their treasury reserves. He starts out by clearing up some common misunderstandings about the cryptocurrency industry, where a lot of people concentrate on building the next big financial services platform or smartphone app. Saylor contends that it is a difficult undertaking to try to compete with well-known financial firms such as JP Morgan. Next, he presents a straightforward yet impactful idea, the opportunity cost of investing in Bitcoin as opposed to keeping conventional assets. Saylor notes that the yield on a company's treasury invested in national debt would be quite small, around 3-5% after taxes. This is much less than the present cost of capital in the US, which is between 8 and 10%. As a result, the treasury is no longer considered an asset, but rather a liability. Saylor believes that companies may achieve exponential development by directing their money to Bitcoin, contrasting this with the possible rewards from investing in the cryptocurrency. He contends that Bitcoin is a profitable investment because of its predicted growth rate of 20-40% each year over the next 10 years, which greatly outpaces the cost of capital. Saylor suggests a risky course of action. Even if companies don't want the money right away for operations, they should think about acquiring financing and buying Bitcoin. Saylor discusses how venture capitalists, VCs' duty to invest in operational firms, prevents them from making direct Bitcoin investments. He proposes that companies may get around this restriction by soliciting money from venture capitalists and utilizing it to buy Bitcoin. With this approach, companies may take advantage of Bitcoin's potential growth without sacrificing operational control. Saylor also highlights the startling amount of capital that is presently invested in conventional assets, which are losing value as a result of inflation. He promotes switching to Bitcoin investments as a safeguard against this depreciation, emphasizing the potential for significant rewards. Saylor's message is quite clear. Companies should give significant consideration to shifting their money to Bitcoin in order to take advantage of its potential for long-term development and wealth preservation in a world where traditional assets are losing value and inflation is rising. 